Good morning, everybody. Getting a little workout in. It is good to see everybody. Welcome to Sunday morning. I think of nothing better we could do than get into God's Word after that. Amen, church? So join with me. We're going to be in Acts 7. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in your chair. That is yours to take home. It is the same one I'm using. It's on page 973. We're going to be reading as we continue in Stephen's story. I'm going to do things a little differently. I'm going to read through it today. Then we're going to kind of dissect it a little bit more here. So join me in Acts 7, starting with verse 54. When they heard these things, they were enraged and they gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and together rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are working. That not only you died for our sins, Lord, but we see through a man named Stephen that we have to be willing to sacrifice it all for you. We thank you. We thank you that your movement did not stop with Stephen, but moved to the world, and that we were able to hear your grace. We fall in love with you. We love you. We thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. World War I, four-year war. Many, everybody knows about it. 9.7 million soldiers died in World War I. Incredible. Even more incredible, 10 million civilians died in World War I. Close to 20 million people died. 23 million people on top of the 20 million people were injured because of the war. So we're talking close to 45 million people that were physically affected by World War I. Incredible, is it not? How did it start? How did it all start? Well, it started like this. The world started to fraction. They started to team up in different countries, creating alliances. There was an arms race that started building. But really, they were at the brink of war, but they were not in war yet until what is aptly known as the shot heard, heard around the world. Now, you may hear that phrase. There's actually two of these. There's the one that happens in the Revolutionary War, but there's one that the world kind of knows a little bit more that happened in World War I. A man named Archduke Ferdinand was in Bosnia on June 28, 1914, and as he was trailing in a car, he gets killed by six assassins. Now, up until this point, war was just talked about. But really, what we could say is because of his murder, his assassination, that those six assassins did not just kill that man, but because of what they did, 20 million people lost their lives. Incredible, is it not? How one thing causes so much. As we look at Stephen's death today, Know that this man did not die in vain. Instead, when Stephen dies, it is a turning point for the church. The church had been in Jerusalem for all of their existence at this point since Christ's death. And they continually reached out to Jews. Some of the Gentiles would come into play, but primarily the church was Jewish. But because of Stephen's death, the church scatters amongst the nations. And not only because they're running in fear, we'll see that later on Saul is actually going after them, who we get introduced to in this passage, but they're running for their lives. But as they're running, what are they doing? They're telling people about the gospel. God uses a terrible event to take his message to the world. And millions, now billions of lives are saved because of one man's murder. We say the shot heard around the world. Really, this is the shot that saved the world. Amen, Amen church? The persecution of the church started with a warning. You guys remember this. 
If you've been with us, the church is blowing up tens of thousands of people. They get arrested by the, the Jewish leadership and they tell them, stop spreading the gospel, which Peter says, I can do nothing but spread the gospel. That's all I have in me is to spread the gospel because I know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So they move on to a flogging. They arrest him and beat the apostles and tell him, do not go and spread this gospel anymore. Again, repeated that anything they have, they can only do for Christ. They move out and continue the church. And now we are finally finishing with a murder. And church, even in murder, God's movement does not stop. Amen? When we meet Stephen, we see him in Acts 6. He's named as one of the first de uh, deacons. He's, made, uh, he's told to go and minister to the Hellenistic Jewish widows. And he goes out unabashedly telling others about Christ. He's the only man that we have seen so far that does miracles besides the apostles. Significant. The spirit is filled within him. A group of Jews try to debate him and they lose. And so they trump up charges against him. Saying, hey, he's blaspheming the temple. He's blaspheming Moses. The purpose was so that he'd be arrested. And so he goes, and for 53 verses, Stephen tells the Jewish leadership why they do not understand who God is. You don't understand, Moses. You don't understand the temple. Everything that you've been living for or saying for, you're not getting it. You don't understand what the redemption of God is found in Christ. And finally he ends in verse 51 yelling at them, you stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit. He finally tells them you don't get it. And he's yelling at them. And so this is their reaction. As Stephen's finally getting to the crux of what the gospel is, they stop him short. And we get to verse 54. Let's pick up again as we kind of review these verses one more time. When they heard these things, they being the Jewish leadership, they were enraged and they gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen ends his defense with an attack on the Jewish leadership. And what do they do? They get mad. They cut him off. They're enraged. Physical reaction to the words. I've been a pastor for a number of years now coming on 15 years now, and I have done very, a ton of VBSs, right? How many people here have worked at VBS? What happens on the, every Friday of VBS? Water day. The dreaded water day. Amen? Uh, I'm not the greatest children's worker. That's why I'm up here and not back there. That's why we have Betsy. But water day happens typically at the end of the week, and that means that everybody gets wet and, and stuff. And it always would happen, and I always watch this. Water Day would always kind of devolve into kids running around and attacking each other. That's pretty much how it goes. And there's always one kid that I knew that had a, a water gun. And as they'd get into a water gun fight, they would get shot too many times. And so that instead of shooting them back with a water gun, what would they do? They would take the water gun and chase after them and try to have you guys ever seen a kid like that? Anybody here? Well, I gotta be honest with you. I'm telling a story about myself. That was me when I was like six years old. I was the kid that would get angry and run around and try, try to, they didn't let me, that's why I don't have a water gun right now. <laughs> but the, the key here is that I would devolve. I would get so angry that I would physically lash out. And you'd see this every single day with water day in VBS. There's always the kid that gets mad. That happened to be me. This is what the Jewish leadership turned into. They got so mad they gnash their teeth. And we're talking about educated people. We're talking about people that have spent their whole life studying scripture. We're talking about people that were not just people coming off the streets, but dedicated their lives to education. They got so angry, they gnashed their teeth like little children and went after Stephen. They devolved to the lowest common denominator of man. Verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. In their midst of the Jewish leadership hissy fit, if we could call it that, amen, Stephen sees the physical Jesus, looking up, sees the physical Jesus 
standing at the right hand of God. Now, this is significant. One, because it makes the Jewish leadership mad because Stephen does not keep this to himself, but instead says, hey, look, there's Jesus standing right next to God. But the second thing is this. When we typically see Jesus at the right hand of God, what is he typically doing? He's sitting. Everywhere in Scripture that we find Jesus when he's the right hand of God, because that's where he goes. And Let me explain that really quickly. When we're talking about the right hand of God, the, the hand to the king, if we could use that, is the one that does all of the work. He is the one that interacts with the people. And so when we see Christ at the right hand, he is the one that is the intermediary between us and the Father God. Still the same God here, but that is how we see him. And so Jesus is standing at the right side, intermediary between us and God, but he's always sitting until we see Stephen. And Jesus is standing. I mean, continually sitting. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Mark 16, 19. So the Lord Jesus, after he'd spoken to them, was taken into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Luke twenty two sixty eight. 68. And I ask you, you will not answer, but from now on the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of God. Acts 2, 34. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to, or, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Sit at my right hand. So I make your enemies... Uh, until I make your enemies your footstool. Some scholars believe this plays into prophecy. What I like to think, and what I believe there's some scholarly backing for, is that Jesus is standing in honor of Stephen's sacrifice as the first martyr. That, Steve, that Jesus is so in love with his servant and sees his servant suffering with faith and perseverance that it physically moves him to stand and watch. Amen, church? Jesus loves us, guys. We don't say that in passing. He is in love with us. And just like if one of us saw one of our family members being hurt, we would not sit back and watch, would we? Jesus is standing, watching Stephen die. Stephen's being honored by Christ. The God he just defended takes him out. Of course, what does this do? It makes the crowd more angry. And so they go from gnashing their teeth to verse 57. They yelled at the top of their voices. They covered their ears, and together they rushed against him. Do you see them? They're going further and further down the pipeline. They're going from civilized scholars to uncivilized angry mob. That's a good way to put it. Against them. They're in denial. They're screaming. They're acting less than children. Church, this is what denial is. It's letting a falsehood remove any piece of humanity from us. These people are not, no longer acting like image bearers of God. Instead, they're acting like the animals. They devolved. They went against. Denial builds, Right? When we don't want to believe the truths of Scripture, the truth of God, the denial builds and it festers until it devolves us. Verse 58, they dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. The religious leaders could send someone to death. They had that ability. We see that with Christ. But what you'll notice in Christ, there's a man named Pontius Pilate in this. See, Pontius Pilate was the Roman representative. we got to remember, Israel is not its own country at this point. They're ruled by the Romans. And so the Romans are overseeing them. So the Jewish leaders could technically give a death sentence, but it had to be approved by the Roman person that was in charge, the proconsul. They did not do that here. Notice this. They are so mad that they drag him out and begin to give him the murder sentence. They did not get approval. They did not go through the proper conviction methods. Instead, they went from being Jewish leadership in charge of a government, or at least somewhat in charge of a government, to straight up murderers going against the law that they were said to protect. They devolved into murderers. The religious leaders in the crowd, they became worse than what they tried Stephen for. Why? Because they're in denial of what the truths of Scripture are. In denial of who God is. 
Verse 59, and let's continue on. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. Stephen's death mimics another death very closely, right? Christ. Very similar, he calls out to forgiveness, even though he is being murdered. What is he doing? He's calling out for forgiveness for the people. His mission was not over because he was getting rocks thrown at him. Instead, he still desperately wanted these people to know who Jesus Christ was. This man understands what this life is for. It was for God alone. See, we don't live for a preservation of life. We don't live for ourselves, but instead we live to preserve others' lives through Jesus Christ. It is the point of us being here. And if we have to die to so that others know the gospel in church, let us die for that others to know the gospel. Amen? amen. I know that's a tough one to say amen to. Saul agreed, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 1. Saul agreed with putting them to death. And know this, that Stephen's death is not impactful enough, as if it's not impactful enough. We meet an accomplice to the murder, a man named Saul, a man that will eventually meet Jesus Christ on a road to Damascus, a man that will eventually write half of the New Testament, a man that will be known as the greatest missionary of all time. We meet him murdering God's, one of God's first spokesmen. He's here. He sees the murder of Stephen, and not only that, he agrees with it. Accomplice to the first martyr. Let's quickly look at the big picture before we get to some details here. A couple key passages, a couple key things to take away is that the leadership, the Jewish leadership continually denied God, his prophets, and most importantly, his son. We see that through the defense. The church is about to move solemnly from Jewish to the Gentiles, which is important to know. And Stephen's death is definitely our first introduction to Saul, with Saul, which is a big deal. Any one of those we could preach on. But we need to know this, that God is on the move with this murder. God's glory will be revealed through this martyrdom. And today, as we look at Stephen's reaction to his murder a little more closely, we're called to be under pressure like Stephen, amen, church? We're called to go under the same persecution as Stephen, and although many of us will, it will be unlikely that we die for our faith, we're still called to be under pressure. That's why we call this series our Under Pressure series. And so we should be prepared to be under pressure. So as we look at Stephen today, we're looking because it's undeniable that Stephen had grace under pressure. Amen, church? And I'm not just talking about a good emotional feeling. I'm not just talking that he was like, hey, I feel good about this. I can do this. I'm talking about he had his eyes on Christ and on mission from the point of the, from the, point of the persecution all the way through his death. And I would like to have that same. So today we're going to be looking at three actions of a person with grace under pressure. What does that look like for us to be the same, to have grace under pressure? The first one is this. To achieve grace under pressure, we need to look up. Verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He looks up. When struggles come, they don't look, he didn't look into himself. He didn't try to run away. He didn't try to figure out how to get past this on his own. But what does he do, church? He looks up. He looks to God. When Andrew and I first got married, we thought, hey, we're, never gonna, we're not going to have kids, which we eventually did. But at that point, we decided not to. So we got dogs. And we rescued two dogs, very big dogs, because we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> and so we get these... And the first dog we rescued was this 90-pound dog. It was big. That small dog? Is a, yeah, it's a big old dog. And uh, he was young, six months old, and he had a bunch of energy. And so when we rescued him, he was trained under the people that rescued him. And they told us to get this little mouth harness. And it wasn't a muzzle. We weren't mean. It was like one of the things that strap around their nose, real light. It, it weighed about two ounces, right? Head harness. Head harness. That's what it is. I don't know fake muzzle thing is what I like to call it. And so you, you, they told us to get this, and we did. 
Um, but we didn't like it, so we got him a chest harness. I'm going somewhere with this, guys. And so they told us, hey, look, hook in the, the, uh, you know, the leash and go walk him. When we put him on the chest harness, he went crazy. He did not, and I'm not disciplined enough to train a dog. He would run and he would pull me, right? Because um, he was strong. And so he'd run out of control, out of control. So we brought the dog back to the, um, to the rescue and we said, we don't know what to do. He won't go with us. So they said, use the face harness thing. And so we said, but it's not going to control him. We can't control him with the harness. This one has no control. And so they showed us that when it attached to the face harness, it wasn't about pulling the dog's neck or anything. It was about bringing the dog to look up. And when he looked up, he, he was in obedience to us. So when he would go out and he would try to run away from us, it was a simple pull up and he could look at us and obey, right? It was a way of controlling him. It was a way that we could, we could run, walk with our dog. And people, when we're walking through the messiness of life, oftentimes we put the chest harness on and believe that we can control it. When in reality, we need our face harness to push us up. Amen? When things start struggling, when things become difficult, our natural reaction, instead of running away from our God, should be to look up and to see him, to see his glory, to see his wonder. Notice Stephen's first response to imminent death, and he knows it's coming. He looks to the heavens. He looks to God. It's almost like a knee-jerk reaction. Stephen was so close and filled with the Holy Spirit that all he could do was look up in the face of trials. And what does he see? He sees Christ standing for him. He sees Christ in awe of him waiting for him, reassuring him. Church, when we are filled with the Spirit, when we actively consume ourselves with God, we'll be reassured by our God. Amen, church? Amen. We're going to compare Christ's death with Stephen's death throughout the Scripture. And in Mark 19, we're pulling up, or we're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in verse 32, it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. This was the night before Christ was killed. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Christ, our God, living here, about to be hung on a cross, he knows what is coming. And what does he do? He looks up, sorrowful to the point of death. He looks up to God. Where do we look when things go wrong? Do we look to ourselves? Do we look to our bank accounts? Do we look to our friends? Church, we must prepare ourselves to always look up, and that means that we're in prayer, and we're seeking the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, it's written for a purpose. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not, and I love this part in verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Do not stop the Spirit in times of trouble. But instead, we are called to rejoice. Church, rejoice always. Pray always. Do not stop or quench the Holy Spirit. So when things go wrong, when the world is coming down, church, what do we do? We look up. We look up to our Savior. We look up to the lights going out. <laughs> Second thing we see here, first one is that we look up under pressure. Second one is this, that we call out. In verse 59, while they were stoning Stephen... Let's just take a second there. While the people were grabbing large rocks and hurling them at this man, Stephen calls out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In the midst of being killed with large rocks, Stephen looks up and he calls out to his God. In third grade, I was at a swim party at a friend's house. One thing you should know about me is that I'm a terrible swimmer. I know, that's sad. I'm, I, <laughs> I swim like a rock, and I was at a friend's house, and at this point, I was even a worse swimmer than I am now, not much worse. 
And as I was swimming, there were about six or seven kids. We were all swimming around. One of the kids had a giant tube, and he jumped in the pool. And he jumped and did not see me, and he kind of landed on me, and his tube was under me. Now, I'm really good at one thing, panicking under pressure. And so <laughs> what did I do in third grade as this kid jumped on me with the tube? I started panicking. I started flailing. Now, I was under the water, and I was trying desperately to call out for somebody, right? Has anybody had a similar experience to this? We were trying to desperately call out, and I could not call out. I could not say it. I could not, they could not hear me. All I was doing was flailing underwater until finally the mom of the kid pulled me out of the water, and it took me a while to come down from this. I started panicking. I could not be heard until I was finally saved. Some of us feel like we're drowning. And as we're drowning, we're doing what we should be doing is call and calling out. And some of us feel like when we call out, we're not getting an answer. We're desperate. We're calling out. Church, our God will answer when you call out to him. Stephen was drowning under a sea of rocks, and he called out while they were stoning him, and our God answered. And what does it mean to call out? It is a sense of desperation when we call out to God. It's a sense of loss where we, when we call out. It is a sense of need when we call out. We call out in weakness. Stephen called out to God knowing that his control was completely non-existent. And Stephen called out to God because he knew it was the only thing that he could do. Our God understands what it means to call out. Because he did it himself. Continuing on with the Jesus narrative, kind of mimicking Stevens here in Mark 14 and going a little further. This is Jesus. He fell on the ground and he prayed out if it were possible that his, this hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup for me. Yet not that I will, but you will. Jesus calls out to the Father. Matter of fact, he says, Abba, Father. Abba, meaning Father. He's calling out in desperation to Father God. Abba, Father, Father, please take this away from me. Please. Christ is calling out. But notice how he finished this. Not my will, but yours be done. Stephen is calling out to God. But notice this, that he's not calling out, save me from this. He's not calling out, take these rocks away, or let me miraculously be taken away. Stephen is calling out, knowing that the will of God needs to happen more than what he wants. And in the same way, Christ looks at God and says, look, this is going to be terrible. But I know it's your will, not mine. When we call out to God, as we're looking up, and we call out to God, we do not call out to God on our terms. We do not call out to God on our conditions. We call out to God and say, your will be done, no matter what happens to me. If that means I'm killed for it, then that means I'm killed for it. Stephen and Christ both knew this. When we call out to God, we understand that it is our call to say this, I'm ready to live in obedience to you, God, no matter what it takes. Stephen probably didn't want to die, just like Christ probably didn't want to be tortured. No, but they wanted to follow the will of the Father. Church, we have to call out to God, and then we conform to him. We look like him. We sacrifice everything for him. With our eyes on God, let's call out to him, telling him we are prepared no matter where it takes us, no matter what it does to us, to follow his will. First thing we do is we look up. Second thing we do is we call out. <clears throat> the last thing we do is we kneel down. Verse 60. And he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Stephen is getting pelted with rocks. 
with the intention of murder, by the way. It's not going to be a, hey, we're going to throw some rocks at you if you live, great. It is to kill him. And as he's getting killed with these rocks, he kneels down and prays for the people murdering him. There's this thing called accolade, and I have a picture of it here. You guys have heard this before. We've heard the word accolade a lot. I didn't realize this until I found it today, that accolade is actually the process of knighthood. Did anybody know that? It's pretty incredible. Yeah, there we go. Graham knew it. Accolade, the, the process of accolade, and it's where the word accolades come from, is the process of knighthood. The potential knight kneels before the king or the queen in complete submission to be called into their service. The knight, the picture of power and might, in complete submission to the seemingly weaker person with the power of the country. The weaker of the two is standing before him. He gets knighted. This is by a queen, obviously. Sometimes it's by a king. The knight's trained. The knight has full ability to probably take down that person. But he kneels down in submission, in accolade. How much easier should it be for us to kneel down in submission to our God? The full, powerful God. The God that's creator of everything. The God is that is infinitely stronger than us. For us to kneel in submission before our God. Finally, in death, Jesus and Stephen, they say the exact same words. Luke 23, 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, they were crucified with him, and the guard, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. And the ruler scoffed at him, saying, If he saved others, let him save himself. If he is Christ of God, he is the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him wine. And saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. Jesus being mocked. Tortured. And eventually killed. What does he say? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Stephen, being mocked, being killed, them being angry. What does he say? Lord, do not hold their sin against them. Jesus and Stephen both knelt down to the will of God. And to the mission of his people. Stephen had a mission and a love for man. Jesus had a mission and a love for man, and neither of them ceased when they were getting persecuted. Church, we're going to be here and call ourselves Christians. We need to have a mission and a love for man. That means that our end goal is to show that love through our mission. This means that we cannot let petty anger, frustrations, selfishness hold us back from the mission to tell others about the salvation of Jesus Christ. These men being pelted, being hung on a tree, still told others about the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. They prayed for them that the sin not be held against them. To be forgiven leads us to one of the scariest because forgiveness is so important. Stephen in his death prayed for forgiveness. This leads us to one of the scariest verses in scripture. It's at the end of the Lord's Prayer. And typically, even this morning as I was reading the Lord's Prayer, I skip this section because it doesn't make me feel good. But in Matthew 6, at the end of Jesus' prayer, it says this, For if you forgive others their trespasses your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's wonderful, isn't it? Let's go on. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your forg Father forgive your trespasses. Church, Stephen was calling forgiveness out on his murderers. Talk about kneeling down to the submission, having submission to God. So much so that he knew that forgiveness was the cornerstone of our faith. And clearly, Jesus clearly states that if we do not forgive others, we will not be forgiven. 
Let's say that again. Let's let that kind of saturate in for a second. That if we, as followers of Christ, do not forgive other people, we will not be forgiven. That sends a shiver down my spine every time I read it. And even more so when I say it. This is severe. And this is purposeful. No, this will not change your salvation. He's not saying that if you do not forgive others, you will not receive the grace of Jesus Christ. That's not what he's saying here. So we need to get that out of the way. But it is severe. And it does affect when we do not forgive others our relationship with God. What was Stephen? Stephen was full of the Spirit. And being full of the Spirit, the byproduct was this, that in his death, he forgave the people killing him. And that's why he was able to see Christ standing on the right hand of the throne. Guys, if we want a relationship with God that surpasses everything, we must live in forgiveness. Why is it so severe? Because if we get caught up in our pettiness, our lack of forgiveness, then we stifle the mission that God has put us on. The car has a purpose, right? We all have those. A car has a purpose, but if you do not change the oil in the car, then at some point, the car loses its purpose. Amen, church? Because it stops working. I'm not saying that from personal experience. I'll let you guys glean that from your own. <laughs> but if we as Christians, our engine is running and we are not changing the oil continually with forgiveness, at some point the engine stops and the mission does not go forward. Anger and a lack of forgiveness is the old oil that stops our mission from going forward. It ruins our testimony of Christ. It's a festering wound that disables the entire person. This is a distraction to what God has called us to, telling others about his saving grace. But Stephen knelt down. And if Christ wasn't nailed to a cross, I'm sure we would see him physically also kneeling down. Stephen forgave the people throwing rocks at him. Jesus forgave the people nailing him to the tree. Kneeling down is an act of submission. In church, we're called to submit. We're called to kneel down to the mission of Christ. And submission means we forgive and get past it. And we love man. So much so that we're willing to do anything so that they know Jesus Christ. Stephen was killed for Christ, and Christ was killed for us. And as we get to the end, and the band comes up and leads us into another, I'm sure, incredible time of worship. When we're looking at the will of God, we are caught, sometimes we get caught up in the trees, and we don't see the forest. Amen? We're desperate. We're lonely. We're hurt. We're confused. And at this point, the church was desperate probably lonely, they were hurt, they are probably confused. But eventually, because of this, the message of the gospel would spread throughout the world, a hurt, lonely, and confused world. They soon would be hunted, they soon would be jailed, and they soon will also be killed. And at the break of World War I, a man named Isaac, Ro uh, Isaac Rosenberg wrote the following poem called On Receiving News of War. The snow is a strange white word. No ice or frost have asked or bud or bird for winter's cost. Yet ice and frost and snow from earth to sky, the summer land doth know, no man knows why. In all men's heart it is, some old spirit, some spirit old, hath turned with malign kiss our lives to mold. Red fangs have torn his faith. God's blood is shed. He mourns from his lone place, his children dead. O oh, ancient crimson curse, corrode, consume. Give back this universe, its pristine bloom. Church, you may be feeling the pressure. You may be feeling like it's the ultimate pressure. The world's bogging you down. It's taking you out. And it's in this moment that we look up. 
We call out and we kneel down knowing that God is in control. And that through Jesus Christ, this world is not just made better, but instead this universe is brought back to its pristine bloom. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your salvation. Lord, as we look at Stephen's salvation, we know that although we are spiritually saved, Although we are living with eternity to you, Lord, it doesn't mean that our physical will not be attacked. That means that we won't be, it doesn't mean we won't be attacked on this earth, Lord. And so we do. We look up to you. We call out to you. And as Napa Valley Life Church, Lord, we kneel down before you. Convict us. Show us how to learn, live in submission, Lord. Give us a faith like Stephen's, willing to do whatever it is for your will. As we're taking a time of getting back into worship, I want you guys to pray. Before we get into worship, before we get into it, this is your time. Maybe it's, it's been a long time since you've called out to God. Maybe it's a long time since you've even looked up at God and you're desperate to see Christ standing. This is the time to call out to him. This is the time to confess, to give whatever it is on you to him. If you need help doing that, I'm going to have our prayer counselors come up and during this first song, you guys can pray with us. Maybe this is your time, first time in church in a long time, and you don't know what it is to be a Christian. You've heard the words, you think maybe it's to go to church or any of that, but you want the life-saving joy. You want to know who Christ is. If you're even confused about that, come up and talk to me. I would love to share that with you. But as we get into this time, let this be your offering to God. Lord, we love you and we thank you truly wonderful. In your precious name, amen.